Hello and welcome to the Small Business Briefing. I'm Brian Kelly, CEO of the Small Business Association of Michigan. Hi, good afternoon. Thanks for tuning in today. I'm Sarah Miller, Vice President of Marketing and Strategic Communications. Um, Brian, let's start off with some new unemployment numbers for Michigan and the U.S. today. Yeah, we had um, we had some numbers announced late last week um, that showed the state's unemployment rate continues to inch upward. So not no big jumps, no um, kind of uh, like shocking developments, but it is up to four and a half percent now. And that's really kind of following along, uh, you know, a trend over the last, I think it's seven months now, where it's just up a tenth of a percent at a time. And um, and, and so it's, it's no one of those months are that concerning. It's more the trend in the context of a lot of other information that's out there right now. Now, the U.S. rate, on the other hand, actually inched downward, so not a big uh um, not a big uh, reduction. I think it was uh, two tenths, yeah, two tenths of a percent downward to 4.2. So um, in that case, it's not, again, not a big move. And then in and of itself, not a big deal, except for it actually breaks the upward uh, trend that had been in place for a while. So um, move the state and the local numbers moving in a different direction. But, you know, overall, it just kind of fills in or kind of paints the picture that, well, the you know the 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 economy doesn't look like anything dramatic is happening. It's just kind of generally feels like it's either stuck in neutral or kind of just trending a little bit negative. So with these unemployment rate announcements, we usually get a labor force update too. So what's happening with Michigan's labor force size? With uh, with the labor force numbers again, not a big dramatic move, but um, kind of inching in the in the wrong direction as well. Sometimes the unemployment rate goes up, but it's for a good reason, like labor force participation increased. In this case, though, we saw um, a decline of about 12,000 jobs over the month in the state, and then that split into a couple of different um, uh, a couple of different categories and. Um, so the, the number of people that count as unemployed, so they became unemployed and are still looking for work, that went up by 5,000 and then about 7,000 exited the labor force. So uh, so we had a slight contraction of the uh, overall um, size of the labor force, which means that, um, again, just kind of the uh, uh, modest movements, but modest movements in the wrong direction. So on last week's show, Brian, we previewed that there would be a potential for an interest rate reduction um, during a meeting middle of the week. Uh, what happened? Yeah, the Federal Reserve met as expected on Wednesday, Wednesday afternoon. They announced the um, a rate cut. The only question was if the Fed funds rate cut would be cut by a quarter percent or a half a percent. And they cut it by a half a percent. So a bigger cut. And I would say an unusually large cut, uh, large cut. And so what that would, would signify is one of two things. Uh, well, first of all, it definitely signifies that they're, um, they're more confident about inflation being in a good place just to change the direction. The rates have been um, held at a, at a two decade long high for about uh, two years. And, um, and so they have, um, they have, reduce the rate back down, long awaited reduction, but they but normally when they reduce the rate, they move it by quarter uh, percent increments. This case, they went a half a percent. And what that would indicate to me is that they are concerned about uh, the jobs market, about the overall condition of the economy, uh, that definitely that they're more concerned about that than they are inflation at the moment, because we saw inflation um, ease back. So overall consumer price index at uh, two and a half percent uh, year over year, and the core inflation rate was higher than that, but uh, not too far off the type of target rate that they normally look for. Uh, so they're not as afraid of uh, of inflation at the moment as the softening jobs market as we saw from the week before. The um, the job numbers have been very very modest, coming down, and also negative revisions to previous months that were already announced. All of those things, I think, have kind of built the case for the Federal Reserve that they need to reduce the uh, reduce the rates. The fact they did it by a half a percent 
tells me that maybe they think that they're late in starting that. But with, with now with hindsight, they probably wish they would have started reducing the rates uh, a meeting or two earlier. And now they're playing catch up mode. We'll see in data Monday today, a, a, a graph and it's gonna show the other instances where you saw half a percent reductions in interest rates and what type of environment that that happened in. I always presume that the, the folks making these decisions have more information than it kind of like generally out there for everybody to see. And um, the stuff that's out there for all, us to, all of us to see generally looks like things are getting softer, kind of heading in a direction of a, um, a slower economy and, uh, and there's a higher potential for recession. Um, so if we can see that out there and they make a big move like that, they probably have other, there's just other things that they're concerned about. And I think we'll know at the next meeting how concerned, because if they do another half a percent cut in the next meeting, um, that would signal, I think, um, almost like alarm that um, that they're moving that fast. It, it's one underscore. The Federal Reserve normally does not do rate cuts that big all at once. They like to move in these incremental steps. And big reductions, especially back to back, would send a message that they're pretty concerned. All right, let's move on to talking about some tax cuts. These went into effect in 2018 and they're set to expire next year. So, Brian, absent congressional action, when would people start to feel the impact of this, um, of the cuts going away? Or, you know, what are the practical impacts that we should expect? Yeah, these are, if you, you might recall, there are a bunch of changes that were made in 2017 that went into effect in 2018. So you start feeling it kind of in the in the uh, the payroll tax. So not next year, but um, the very beginning of the year after that. So January of 2026 is when people would really start feeling the, uh, the impact. So um, there are a couple of things that you should probably, that I think would, like most people would, uh, would feel. First is um, there's a, the uh, child tax credit was beefed up at that time. So that would revert back to what it was before. So people with kids like likely would feel um, an impact on it. Also, there was um, the way that deductions worked is there's always been like a standard itemized or a standard deduction and then an itemized deduction. And it, back in 2017, they made the standard dedu deduction a lot, lot bigger. And so it made it so that most people don't itemize their uh, taxes. It made it simpler, their tax returns simpler in that sense, but then also um, it it got more of a, most people got more of a tax deduction than they otherwise would have. That would revert back to the old system where uh, people would then be itemizing, more people would be itemizing their tax deductions, things like charitable contributions or mortgage, uh, in, um, mortgage interests or um, uh, local property taxes, your state taxes, you know, your state and local taxes are deductible. One thing on the other side of the ledger, though, in terms of people that pay a lot of state and local taxes, including your real estate taxes, um, there's a cap on what you can deduct today that went into effect in 2018. That cap would be removed. And so the and higher people that live in higher tax states would actually benefit from that. It would essentially, being in a higher uh, taxing jurisdiction would lower your federal income taxes. So a lot, there's some movements back and forth, but overall, the uh, the tax foundation, which is um, which is like the gold standard for uh, for um, for calculations or changes in in, uh, in tax policy, has indicated that uh, for taxpayers. Now, keep in mind, I'm talking about people that pay federal income taxes. So taxpayers, there are, a lot, there are many many people who don't pay federal income taxes. But for people that do, the uh, the result on average would be about two thousand eighty one dollars per year more in taxes if they expire. So for those who pay federal income taxes, that's the uh, the type of uh, of, a, of an impact. Um, neither candidate for president, by the way, has put out very detailed uh, plans. There have been lots of statements, and you can you can get a sense for um, the. Um, that there's certain aspects that that you know that obviously President Trump was in office when all this went into effect. So, extension of those tax cuts seems to be a pretty uh, straightforward shot. Um, Vice President Kamala Harris um, or Kamala Harris has has indicated maybe um, 
that uh, some of them could be extended, but maybe not others. Uh, so there's a, um, there's, I'd say it's kind of generally cloudy, but one thing that the same report from the tax foundation said was that uh, the deficit uh, overall, the size of the deficit is likely to go up, the federal deficit under either candidate, because both are promising uh, a lot a lot of things without um, without plans of how to cover the costs. And uh, so it seems like the tax policy is up in the air, but higher deficit spending seems to be a lock. All right, let's revisit a story about the minimum wage schedule here in Michigan, the one that is per, um, supposed to take effect on February 21st next year. Governor Whitmer had asked the Michigan Supreme Court for a clarification on that schedule, and that answer came last week. What did we learn? Yeah, so uh, we, we talked about this last week, but it was, you know, it's funny, the on Monday, the deadline that the governor had asked for the Supreme Court had passed. So she said, hey, look, I, uh, here's how I'm going to interpret this thing. If if it's not correct, let me know by September 15th. Well, September 15th came and went. And uh, and so we figured, OK, they didn't say anything. So it must be that they agreed. Well, they waited just a few more days, September 18th. They put out a um, this clarifying statement. And, and and basically confirmed what the uh, the interpretation that the governor had kind of endorsed. So um, that really does make it at this point a sure thing. The um, the the schedule that we had uh, that we had estimated and that we had communicated to what we expected minimum wage to go to was um, was confirmed by the Supreme Court. So it'll be twelve forty eight twelve dollars and forty eight cents. Right now it's ten dollars and thirty three cents. It'll go up to $12.48 on February 21st, unless the legislature makes some changes. And then also there'll be a series of changes that happen each year, moving it up to just under uh, uh, $15 an hour on a predetermined set schedule over the next four years. And then it will uh, be increased by inflation or the consumer price index annually after that. This first uh, change will happen on February 21st. Again, absent uh, legislative action, it will happen. And then it'll go back, it'll revert back to the January 1st schedule after that. So when it goes, it, it'll go up by another 6.5% or so, uh, January 1st, uh, 2026, and then January 1st, 2027, and then January 1st, 2028. Um, will uh it'll hit uh 1497 is where it tops off on the predetermined schedule and then um from that point it will um it'll go up by inflation so who knows what inflation will be in uh in that year now the wage and hour division has not actually published those rates yet but the fact that the governor had asked through the attorney general for this clarification the supreme court has now endorsed that clarification I think it's just a matter of time before they publish um, at, at least the first uh, change, which will be um, February 21st, moving to uh, $12.48 per hour. Oh, and by the way, at that same time, the uh, tipped minimum wage, so the tipped wage, instead of being 38% of the minimum wage, of the regular minimum wage, it would become 48% of the regular minimum wage. That goes up every year until tipped wage and minimum wage are the same uh, over the next uh, four years. But uh, the first one, it moves from 38% to 48%. And so for restaurant owners, it's a bit, a bit of a double whammy. So the, the minimum wage itself goes up. So the thing you apply the tipped wage percentage to is going up, but then also the percentage is going up. So it'll go from 38% of 1033 It'll become 48% of uh, 1248. And uh, so it'll be a pretty big change for restaurants, although in the future that change will get even bigger as the tipped wage system is eliminated altogether. And stay tuned if you're on our grassroots email list, you will be getting a new um, request to submit a, uh, for a call to action tomorrow morning, and we'll have it on our website later in the day. So um, uh, just an, another way to tell your legislators how you feel about these pending rules. All right, so Brian, Amazon made a pretty big announcement on their work rules last week. 
Yeah, there was um, so Amazon, the you know the tech giant Amazon, a very uh, large employer in um, in the U.S. and around the world, um, had uh, had made an announcement that um, that come next year that that all of their office workers had to be full time five days a week in the office, and this was uh, over growing concerns of both productivity and just kind of loss of company culture being spread across the landscape now they're they're just the latest of the uh, the corporate giants to to attempt to do this others for whatever reason have been unsuccessful and so the i wouldn't be surprised if amazon later on delayed this or made changes to it but the um the uh overall just to give you a, put it in context um Amazon would be joining just 7% of the larger tech firms that mandate full-time office attendance. Um, and it's, um, I'm a little skeptical that it'll, it'll end up turning out that way, but, uh, but it is kind of interesting that the, the bigger employers continue to try to move in this direction. And uh, the vast majority so far have been um, have been fairly unsuccessful. At the same time, we see with smaller employers, um, you know, flexibility is one of the things that those who are able, you know, are in the type of business that can offer uh, hybrid, remote, or flexible work environments use to uh, compete against their larger competitors for uh, for talent. But Amazon's just the latest, and um, We'll see how that goes, but um, I don't know. I guess I would probably predict they'll be unsuccessful in that change and will probably delay or significantly modify their expectations. All right, so bucking some economic trends, consumer sentiment is on the rise. Tell us more. Yeah, this is uh, one, of the, one of the trends out there that actually has been quite resilient in, in, in the most recent uh, consumer um, sentiment surveys from September actually show uh, the highest since uh, before summer. And uh, and so that's it's one of the things where um, even in, when you see the jobs market cooling off in um, here in the US, you see you know unemployment and GDP and all those things, you know either looking kind of stagnant or not particularly um, impressive. In fact, uh, continuing claims for, uh, unemployment and new claims kind of starting to inch up too. So all of these things would point towards so a softening economy, and yet consumer sentiment is still um, pretty decent right now. In the U.S. economy, um, can, this, consumers have a lot to say with uh, with what direction the economy overall goes. And one of the things that is helping that sentiment is that consumers are starting to believe that inflation is under control because one of the things they ask about is what are your expect expectations for cost increases over the next year? And the expectations that people have going forward is not for costs to go down, but for, uh, they actually ask people for a percentage and average it. So the average expectation for the next year is 2.7%. That would actually still be high compared to most of, you know, most of us that are uh, like, uh, adult consumers out there in the world today, but the um, but still a lot less than what uh, people have experienced over the last few years. So that is probably um, impacting the overall uh, consumer sentiment. But as long I the way I see it, as long as consumer sentiment stays in a pretty decent place, it's hard to imagine the U.S. economy faltering too much. All right, let's uh, get um, next up would be our data Monday. All right. So we didn't get to this um, last year or last week because we ran out of time. So we've got some some information that I'd like to share, um, some of which is new and some uh, came out the, the week before, but you may or may not have come across yet. Uh, first is um, the National Federation of Independent Businesses put out their um, optimism index. They're, they do a monthly survey. We do a survey just of the of businesses in, in Michigan. This is a national survey. And um, I wanted to show this particular um, uh, slide because it shows both optimism and um, an outlook. 
And we saw, you know, that you can't see it that well, but there's uh, both and both of those lines, the orange line and the blue line, it does kind of hook over and turn a bit negative when it had been looking like it was trending a bit positive. And um, I can def definitely testify to that sentiment like, um, like things aren't easy right now. We're hearing that quite a bit, um, but it's really partly tied to economic conditions, but partly tied to just changing regulatory environment that has made things quite, uh, quite tricky out there. Also, um, while it's slightly down from last month, uh, inflation still is number one, the number one biggest concern among uh, employers. And then you see creeping back up quality of labor. Now, p businesses are paying more for labor um, than, than they have in a long time. And, um, and so the need to get high productivity and quality by uh, work or quality out, output um, is more important than ever. And so that's what we see as the top concerns among business right now and ask, this is, what's your single biggest problem? Inflation, number one, quality of labor coming in at number two. Uh, now, these are the um, the inflation numbers, and I wanted to show this because it'll be kind of um, context for some other things that we're, that we're going to talk about, including interest rates, and to put that in context as well. Um, so inflation, uh, we've there's a lot of ways to measure inflation. CPI is the one that's famous that everybody pays most attention to. And um, and so 2.5%, and then um, excluding food and energy, um, that uh, what you consider like core inflation at 3.2%. So this is where the, the Federal Reserve is looking at both of these measures, you know, generally coming down off um, highs. And even though they would... I'm sure that the Federal Reserve would have liked to have seen overall inflation at 2% uh, before they started um, decreasing rates. The softening jobs market, I think, really kind of forced their hand ahead of uh, the uh, uh, the head of inflation uh, coming in exactly where they wanted it. So let's take a closer look at the categories. Lots and lots of categories. So I've got um, on the left-hand side, this is month over month. So this is changes in price over just one month. And then on the right-hand side is year over year. So you can see um, uh, airfare month over month back on the rise, but uh, you see natural gas and fuel oil, used cars and trucks, um, all of those continuing um, deflation. So in other words, reduction, again, month over month. This is not year over year, but just last month compared to, to this month and uh, or this month of data. The um, In the year over year, we see used cars and trucks uh, down 10% from a year ago, fuel oil down 12% from a year ago, but um, motor vehicle insurance, tobacco and smoking uh, products, um, owner's equivalent rent and rent of primary residence. So owner's equivalent rent would be like a homeowner's expense. And then uh, rent uh, of uh, of primary residence would be rental expenses for those who, who uh, lease or rent a home or apartment. All of those being, um, you know, 5% or more. But if you look at a lot of these areas, um, motor vehicle maintenance and repair, food away from home, electricity, meats, poultry, fish and eggs, the ones that are above the average, you see these are the sorts of things, most of these are, are the sorts of things that you can't really avoid. And that's one of the reasons why uh, people are still feeling inflation maybe a little bit more than policymakers or the political people um, would expect, because those things you can't avoid uh, tend to be the things that are above the average. And then, um, Consumer price index um, separating out um, goods and services. So they call it in this chart commodities, but think of those as tangible things and uh, and services. Um, and then they take out those um, you know energy and food to get to those kind of core inflation numbers. And the difference between these is really quite stark. So you see commodities are in deflation territory, negative 1.9% year over year. So in other words, tangible things, except for food and energy, tangible things are 
are down from a year ago, 1.9% less than one year ago, not less than three years ago, but from one year ago. And the, uh, but services are up 4.9%. And so this has to be one of the things when, when, um, the Federal Reserve is kind of going back and forth. Have we done enough? Can we take the rates down? And it's like, well, uh, but you have such different stories here between goods and services. And it's one of the things I know they wrestled with. Um, initial jobless claims you see in the orange are those that are continuing. So jobless claims that people that were already jobless before and they're just continuing another week of that benefit. And then um, and then the, the new entrance to the market both of those um, are up. So there's an axis on both sides of this graph. So the, the blue one is on the right side of the graph. The orange one is on the left side uh, of, the, uh, of the graph, just to get an idea of the scale that we're talking about here. But both, you know, one kind of up and has been sustainably high. Um, the jobless numbers had actually dropped way down and then and the weekly numbers, um, the initial uh, weekly numbers, but those came up, it looked like maybe they were starting to come down. In fact, they did come down some, but hooked up a little bit in this last week. Again, more crosswinds. And then we're gonna finish up with two slides on the Fed funds rate. So um, this first one is, uh, is just showing the history going back to the year 2000, so 24 years back. And you can see what it looks like. See this, this drop from here, to here is a half a percent. Okay, here to here is a half percent. These these other little ones, see how these little steps up? Those are all quarter percent increases. So what do we have here? A half percent, then another half percent, then another half percent. So they did these successive half percents and look at the shaded area. That's when there was a recession. And then let's look over here. This Look at this drop ahead of the recession, a half percent drop. Then they actually, it looks like this about a 1% drop here, another half percent drop. So you have these big drops, those happen around recessions. And please don't misunderstand this. Rate cuts do not cause recessions. Rate cuts are things that the Federal Reserve does to try to combat recessions. And so in the past, when you've seen these bigger rate cuts, and that it was the case over here too, right by the pandemic, uh, that they dropped rates down really, really fast. And there was a short um, but deep recession during uh, during just basically just during a quarter. But the um, it's an in, it's an indication to me that they they only drop rates that fast when recessions are more likely. OK, that's the point that I was trying to make with this, that the fact that they dropped rates a half percent and they're and they're setting expectations or they're considering another half percent drop. Um, in the past, that has signaled that uh, recessionary risks were much higher. And um, and that's in fact, in the last 24 years, what we've seen. The other thing I wanted to share was just the way that the Fed funds rate, which is the rate that, um, that banks borrow at, okay, the rate that banks borrow at, that feeds into the cost of other, type of borrow, other types of borrowing. So the, it's not a direct one-to-one -one relationship. The This 30-year mortgage rate, you see how it got really down low, below 3%, and hopefully some of you got mortgages below 3%. And then um, as the Federal Reserve started increasing these rates, look what started happening with the, with the interest rates. They kind of track right along with it. Not exactly, because these rates are in, are what um, are what the private sector is, is, is charging for 30 year rates, they're trying to guess what the rates will be in the future. And that's how those markets are set. So the fact that these rates got high, um, you know, you see how it got up higher here when the rate was stable at the Fed funds rate, that meant that the market thought that the Federal Reserve might make rates go even higher. And then you see them drop down. What that meant was that they thought the Federal Reserve might start cutting rates and then they didn't. They just kept them the same for quite a while. And um, and then finally they started to trail off as it became more and more clear. So you see this, this these mortgage rates going down. That was in anticipation of this rate cut that everybody knew was coming, just didn't know how big it would be. 
And then the same with the uh, with car loans. Although the further you get away from what's called what what you'd consider like risk free lending or low risk lending, you know, a home loan mortgage is less risky than say a car loan for those who are doing the borrowing. So there's the relationship is less perfect, uh, but you can see it all kind of tracks together. And uh, so I just wanted to kind of explain how as these rates go up and now start to come back down and they're definitely prescripting another rate cut in November uh, for uh, for the Fed funds rate. That means that mortgage rates will likely continue to trail down over the course of the next couple of months, unless the Federal Reserve says something that changes that expectation again. So um, the, the, the markets usually have these rate cuts worked into what you would pay if you went to a bank or credit union to get a mortgage ahead of when the actual rate cut happens. So um, just a little illustration of what happens, uh, what has happened in the past and what is likely to happen here as we continue with this uh, loosening of monetary policies. All right, well, thanks, Brian. Um, before we say goodbye, I do wanna mention that for those of you who might be tuning in from um, areas in the Upper Peninsula, we do have several events um, in the UP this week and Marquette and Houghton specifically. So visit sbam.org slash events if you want to join us there. Um, have a great rest of your week and we will be back here next Monday at 3 p.m. Thanks everybody. See you next week.